Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to thank you all for all of your prayers. I'm feeling much better. Um, I do have some significant nerve damage in my left arm and left hand uh, where I broke my wrist a while back. Uh, I'm hoping I don't need another surgery. I just ask for your continued prayers. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm not ready to go on with Colossians yet, so I'm still working on our next Colossians video. And I want to fill the time with something that I believe is of the utmost importance. I've made a number of videos on the gospel before, but I've never really gone into depth as far as, as the, uh, the real dynamics of the gospel. Uh, folks, the truth is I could spend a whole entire year doing nothing but presentations of the gospel. Uh, as far as all of its the dynamics is concerned. So if you'll just bear with me, I'd like to share with you a few uh, thoughts that I've had about the gospel over the past 32 years. As you know, if, you're, if you've been a follower of this channel, you know that I am what people would call a Calvinist. Now, I don't like that term because in, in this uh, I just don't like the term in the sense that, you, you know, you're, we're lab labeling people uh, uh, contrary to what Paul said, uh, that we're not of, of Paul, we're not of Apollos, we're not of Cephas, we're, but we're of Christ. Uh, I'll just go right, come right out and say it. And I, some of you have heard me say this before, how I believe that the gospel is Calvinism. And by that, what I mean is the truths of Calvinism, the in specifically the five tenets of Calvinism, which Arminianism uh, argues, uh, their argument is is basically uh, that their argument, folks, is is basically that. They have a different view of each of those five tenets. It's just, and it's basically the opposite view of those five. Um, I just want to cover that a little bit in 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 a video, and and I hope that this video isn't drawn out too long, or that it takes two days to upload it. But there's just so much that I want to say about it. I think the best thing to do is would be here would be just to go ahead and and quote the gospel as as it has been written by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, and I, now listen, I want you to listen very closely to this presentation by Paul. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. Now there are there are phrases, uh, words and phrases contained in this that we have to really stop, I believe, and put a whole lot of thought into. The very fact that that Paul would say gospel which I preached unto you implies that there would be others who would preach a, a gospel that's contrary to that. And the very fact that he would say, which also ye have received, okay, now that that's a little more in-depth because not only does that imply that there will be others that will receive another gospel, but it also has the implication that the God's people will receive the gospel. There's no question there, but that they will receive it. Now, you may you may think that that's kind of reading, you know, the, the, in between the lines, or you know, reading the white spaces there. But for the Holy Spirit to to say that ye have received, I think requires a little more meditative thought. And wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. Now, my contention is, is that. Uh, over uh, the span of history, the religious system has not done that. 
They've not kept in memory just exactly what Paul did preach unto his listeners. Unless ye have believed in vain. And again, I, I believe that there is a possibility of us believing in vain. It's not that, that we would believe in the true gospel in vain, but that we would have some distorted view of the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And I want you to underline that part, according to the scriptures. He died for our sin, according to the scriptures. Folks, there's not a whole lot of emphasis today that put on that phrase according to the scriptures because he died for our sins period does not completely give us the whole entire picture I would expect that Christians would read that and you know they would read that which said for I uh, delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and they would look in the scriptures and see what all pertain to his dying for our sins, if you follow what I'm saying. The, all of the dy dynamics that uh, surround the, the death of Jesus Christ and what it meant and what Jesus Christ actually accomplished on the cross. The Bible declares in so many words just what Jesus Christ accomplished on, on, the, on behalf of his people by dying for their sins. And Paul says, for our sins, according to the scriptures. And if, and if that wasn't enough, the, the Holy Spirit repeats that phrase again, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. In other words, what did his resurrection Accomplish. What did it mean? What, what all, what were all the dynamics that were involved in that resurrection? Because we were actually raised with him. What did he? What did he accomplish through that resurrection? And I've covered that in many of our videos, and many of these are are can can be seen. Uh, all of the truths that surround his death, burial, and resurrection, folks, they they tend to to migrate outward toward many doctrinal truths that are true of the believer, if that makes any sense. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. A very heavy emphasis on the fact that, that there were reliable witnesses to, to this. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the the church of God, but I want you to notice verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. It, Paul didn't say, but by my decision, I am what I am. And, and if you, if you really stop for a moment and you look at the good news, what we, what we call the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you won't find any reference at all whatsoever to anything that we do. The good news is not man must do something. The good news is Paul plainly stating what Christ has done. Now that is a very important aspect to all of this. It's, it's a simple aspect that, that many believers fail to grasp. I, I hear Christians every day quoting the gospel. But they will then add to that gospel some condition on man's part or that he must do something if God is going to do something. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. 
Now that, that's a mouthful. I could spend a, I could, I could devote an entire message. In fact, an, in, uh, an entire series of videos on that one statement. Why? Because it says so much, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Why was it not in vain? Because Paul was obedient, because Paul accepted, because Paul received, because God, uh, Paul met God half. He did his part. Christ did his part. So Paul did his part. Therefore, because Paul did his part, the grace which was bestowed upon him was not in vain. You can't say that. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. We preach, ye believed. Again, a whole entire message could be brought to bear on that one phrase. Folks, nothing in that biblical declaration of the gospel highlights in the slightest way God will do something if man does something. Nothing. The only mention that God makes of us is our having received it because why? We're told why. Because his sheep will hear and receive it. By the grace of God I am what I am. And the argument between Arminians and Calvinists, if you want to if you want to look at it from that perspective, they are two major theological persuasions. It boils down to a simple disagreement. Does God elect us or does God in some manner allow us to choose? What governs and, and judges such a debate? The Word of God. Not our emotions, not, not human reasoning, not human logic, not emotion or feelings or anything like that. Like, well, that's, that's one interpretation. Folks, there is only one interpretation of Scripture, and that is what the Holy Spirit had in mind when he wrote it. The truth is that Scripture makes no mention whatsoever anywhere of our will, human will, being the deciding factor. You, don't, you do not see that in the gospel. Now, I'm sure that you, you know, you're well aware of the fact that, that people can make the argument that, oh, but Steve, I know it doesn't say that in the gospel, but it says it elsewhere. Now, what it says is it says that his sheep will hear his voice. That's what he said. He said, I chose you. You did not choose me. We have to take all of Scripture that surround where that the gospel is the, the center of the hub of the wheel, or that it spokes out to all all these other these enormous wonderful truths concerning the person and work of Christ, and we have to take and tie, connect those spokes to the hub. that salvation depends upon some human contribution. This is the one truth that mankind in general fails to comprehend as it concerns the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever form the human contribution takes, it always means that salvation is a cooperative activity. That salvation is not a God-only process as the word declares but a God and man process. We call that synergism. And this religious philosophy with humanistic overtones was alive even in Old Testament times. Folks, it's not something new. It's been debated since the beginning. And it's been in evidence in every generation. It is man's demand not to be considered impotent okay it's his demand not to be considered dead unwilling unable he is simply unwilling to admit his death if you really go back to the beginning of where this whole argument starts the the, the believer or the individual as just just calling the individual 
is either going to come to understand that he was spiritually dead or he was not. In modern Christianity today, outright, just denies outright the spiritual impotence of man, the, the fact of his total depravity, that he was spiritually dead. And folks, that is fatal to any sound theological soteriology. It is a denial of man's total bondage in sin and a claim to some remaining will to absolute good. And this defines most, unfortunately, most of modern evangelicalism today, which ignores the word of God that declares that unregenerate man is spiritually dead, whereby there is no will toward the good, but by being totally depraved, who is in bondage to his fallen will, who must be made alive first before he can believe. It makes, it makes the grave assumption that God's sovereignty and man's free will work side by side in the matter of redemption. And folks, it was condemned as heresy, okay? When the Synod of Dort in, in, in the year 1610 defended and ruled in favor of a God-only salvation. It helps to know a little bit of church history. And those who argued against it, we'll call these the Arminians, they were expelled from Holland for 20 years. They were allowed back into the country in 1630. And historically, you know, historically, the view that God and man must work together in the matter of redemption was officially accepted in 1798. I want you to keep in mind that the first colonists landed in, in America where there were no churches at Plymouth Rock in the year 1620. So they were expelled from Holland in 1610, not let back in until 1630. The pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock 1620. And most were Calvinists. Most were God only. Most believed in monergism, not synergism. But that would soon change as America became settled. I find it interesting that, you know, you, you know, I've always liked numbers and for just for what it's worth, I'll throw this out there. 2020 will mark 400 years since the Mayflower landed in 1620. And 2020 will also be 222 years, 222, since this most gravest of errors was officially recognized by Holland in 1798. God and man is known as Arminianism. God only is known as Calvinism. And it is quite the task to convince Christians today of the truth concerning Arminianism when they were born, they and we, we, you were, you were born into a synergistic system of belief that has steered modern evangelicalism for now over 10 generations since the Synod of Dort in 1610. 10 generations, folks. It's deeply entrenched in America as well as the rest of the world, because America has spread it to the rest of the world. Holland, where all of that debate took place, helped spread it throughout the world. But I find it also interesting that God set Israel aside. They were supposed to be a light to the nations. He set them aside in unbelief. He raises up the greatest of all nations, I think, uh, you know, you can call me a... Uh, a nationalist if you want to. I believe that he, grew, he raised up the greatest of all nations, America, which was primarily Christian and primarily monergistic to, to, to be somewhat of a light to all the nations. And yet, despite that, America as a country, as a nation, as a people has failed as far as the gospel is concerned 
in discerning the truth of the gospel that it is monergism, not synergism. At the birth of America in 1776, Arminianism was only 22 years away from being officially recognized by Holland in 1798. And this Synod of Dort, and when I say Synod, I'm just, just you can trans, trans uh, plant the word, uh, put the word uh, meeting in the place of Synod. This assembly, this meeting to settle disputes, to, to determine what they believed was true or not true. This Synod of Dort, the assembly of the Reformed Church of the Netherlands, they met in 1618, 1619. And that was 400 years ago. The Arminian delegation, they rejected the strict Calvinist doctrine of predestination the doctrine that God elects or chooses those who will be saved. And they did that, folks, despite the fact that that was what Scripture boldly declared. Now, that, that alone should have set off alarm bells, but it didn't. Ephesians 1.5 predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Romans 8.30 predestined. He, those he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified and so on. Ephesians 1.11, predestined according to the purpose who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Romans 8.29, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. 1 Corinthians 2.7, predestined before the ages to our glory. Paul is absolutely clear on the matter of, of predestination. God used Paul to reveal the truth of predestination in at least five verses that I know of. But we can go back to Acts, Acts chapter 4, verse 28. We see the word predestined there used as well. And I find the event that took place historically extremely interesting. And I want you to listen very carefully to what happened. Now, most Christians are unaware of this one important fact of church history. The Synod was attended by Calvinist Dutch delegates and also by delegates from Reformed churches in, in, in other places, Germany, Switzerland, and England. And it was hoped that this gathering, this meeting, would bring agreement on the doctrine of predestination, of predestination among all the Reformed churches. The Arminians refused to accept the rules established by the Synod, and they were eventually they were expelled. The, the meeting, the, uh, I don't know, the elders, the ones that, that, that presided over this Synod, they then they studied the theology of the Arminians and, and they declared, get this, they declared that it was contrary to Scripture. The canons of Dort were produced. They discussed in detail in five sections the errors of the Arminians that were rejected as well as the doctrines that were affirmed. And the doctrines affirmed were that predestination is not conditional on belief that Christ did not die for all, the total depravity of man, the irresistible grace of God, and the impossibility of falling from grace and losing your salvation, the preservation of the saints. These canons of Dort, along with the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, remain the theological basis of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands and of the Christian Reformed Church in North America. It's difficult today to, de to really determine just how many Christians worldwide there are who adhere to the tenets of Calvinism, which is the gospel. You know, what percentage of Protestants are Calvinists? less than 2% by some estimates. I refer you to some of my previous videos and what I believe helps define the apostasy of our age. 
If you believe, as I do, that the good news is what Christ did, not what man must do, then you embrace the same beliefs that the Council of Dort upheld. And what were the five tenets that they upheld? Well, first, it was that predestination is not conditional on belief. John 10, 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And then there was the irresistible grace of God, John 20, again, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And you dare mention predestination today, and the result will be the same as what occurred when Peter and John stood before their own synod, the council, okay, in Acts 4. I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. Verse 17 begins with, But that it spread no further among the people, let us strictly threaten them. How many, how many times have you, have you been persecuted for being a Calvinist? Let us threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them, and they commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Stop. Calvinists today are labeled as heretics in exactly the same way. Verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And how many times have I pointed out the importance of going by what is written, not by what man says? Verse 21, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. Stop. Folks, they can't charge Calvinists with anything. Because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. Okay? Verse 21. Verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Okay? God made it. Have you ever stopped to consider that that includes you? Not just physically, but spiritually, that God made you. Verse 25, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before, that's predestination, to be done. Verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with with all boldness, that they may speak thy word. That's what we read in Acts 4. And then we're looking at the impossibility of falling from grace. John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Okay? Upheld at the Council of Dort. Rejected by Arminians. 
Another aspect, another tenet was that Christ did not die for all. And we know from Scripture that his death was substitutionary. He died in our place. It wasn't a death that was provisionary. Matthew 1.21, right at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew 1.21, And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save who? His people from their sins. John 10.11, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Who did he give his life for? The sheep. You won't find a single verse that says that Jesus gave his life for goats. Romans 9, 13, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And then we come to the total depravity of man, which really kind of is at the beginning, not the bottom here. Romans 3, 9 through 12, What then? Are, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Let that sink in for a moment, folks. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now, folks, even from a logical standpoint, does Arminianism make one? Does it does it make one lick of sense to you? I mean, if you were to be honest with yourself, a dead man simply can't hear. A dead man can't raise himself from the dead. It makes sense to me. Okay, the problem is getting people to understand that they're dead to begin with. The problem is getting people to understand that they are dead to begin with. It's not exactly something that they know or they learn by experience. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, I, yeah, I was spiritually dead. I remember that. We have to take God at his word. We just have to take the Word of God at face value. I believe when God said said that man fell, he didn't mean, you know, man just, you know, skinned his knee, but that he killed over, clean over, and he died dead as a doornail, spiritually speaking. He was transferred to a kingdom of darkness, he, to a state of broken fellowship, un. I mean, accompanied by a total inability to do anything to, to appease God, to please God. Unless God acted first, which he did, which was the whole purpose for God giving his beloved son to die in our place and be buried and raised from the dead, and which is the gospel. The Arminian presentation of another gospel which makes salvation conditional upon something that you must do, which the true gospel makes no mention of. It doesn't just reduce what Christ did. I mean, it outright ignores it. Just by insisting man must in some way assist God in making himself worthy of eternal life. No matter how it's packaged, no matter how it's presented, it comes down to mankind as being that which determines his own destiny by becoming a worthy recipient of what Christ did. And I consider that blasphemy. The central focus being on his will, you know, man's will, man's decision, man's work, man's devotion, man's love, man's dedication, man's determination. It all becomes all about man. It all be, it becomes all about us and what we do or do not do rather than what uh, than about who Christ is and what he did. A stark difference that, you know, you'd think that even children could recognize if they were paying half attention. Typically speaking, critical thinking is is rare within the religious system that we call Christianity today. They just step in line. They're not becoming transformed. They're, be, they're, they're, they're becoming uh, 
uh, they just conform themselves to the world. They don't become transformed in the renewal of their mind. They don't allow scripture to renew their minds, their thinking, their own unfamiliar, uh, unfamiliarity with scripture, lack of study, combined with groupthink, a herd mentality, has robbed them of seeing the wonder and the beauty of just what Christ did, is doing, and will do in the lives of his people. I've been labeled a Calvinist from the first moment that I heard my shepherd's voice say, you did not choose me, but I chose you, John 15, 16. Folks, you either believe that or you don't. If Calvinists are guilty of anything, it's giving God too much credit, too much glory. You know, personally, I, I find it impossible to even imagine us standing before our Lord someday where we hear him say, you know, you know, I really did appreciate your love and your devotion and, and you know, and all that, you know, but you kind of went too far with the giving me all the glory stuff. And folks, our numbers may be few, you know, just a small band of raggedy outcasts, you know, who smell like fish. Persecuted by a world religious system whose strength is in numbers rather than in God. Kind of reminds me of, you know, of me also being, in a, uh, being a smelly Walmart deplorable. Same thing, except, you know, one's political, one's spiritual. But I am totally at peace with that because my faith is in Christ, not myself. Which is where Arminianism takes you. Whereas Calvinism takes you away from that, to Christ. It drives you to Christ. The truths of Calvinism drive you to Christ. It represents, it encompasses the gospel. Or the gospel lies at the very heart of Calvinism. Folks, Calvinism is the gospel. And if that offends people, it offends their, their sense of self-worth, self-dignity. I am totally at peace with that because my faith is in Christ, not myself, which is the very heart, the very essence, the very core, the very central point of the whole matter. It all comes down to the question of who we are really trusting in. Christ, in whom there is life, or ourselves, wherein there's only death. God love you all. I truly do. Be back in Colossians in a few days. Thanks for watching.